The Rockets took advantage of Steph Curry's absence last night, beating the Warriors in Game 3, 97-96. And uh, even with the series now at two games to one, the Warriors still have a 97% chance to win it, according to BPI. Stephen A., what should the Warriors do with Curry now? Um, I could barely hear you because somebody was in my ear while you were asking the oh. question. Could you ask that again, please? Of course. What should the Warriors do with Steph Curry now? <sighs> well, listen, you don't want the series to tie 2-2. Um, you certainly don't want a replica of last night, but I think it depends. I think if, if Steph Curry uh, is not close to 100%, you don't take the chance. Uh, if you think additional days rest is going to help him, you do whatever you can do to make that happen. Worst case scenario is that the series is going to be tied 2-2. Now, that's a precarious position for them to be in, no doubt. But nevertheless, I think this Warriors team can beat Houston without Steph Curry. I think they should have won last night's game. I don't see them playing the same way they played last night in game four. So I think when you look at it from that perspective, I would say, hey, why not? I mean, why, why not sit them out? I don't know uh, if they will, it all depends on how he's feeling. Because if you're Steph Curry, you don't want to keep sitting out these games. There's no doubt about that. But if you have an opportunity to win without him and to elevate your level of confidence and to show your fluidity, your chemistry, your cohesiveness without him, he's not going to compromise that when he comes back. So I think that it would be an incredible challenge for Golden State to show up for game four without the services of Steph Curry and to take on that challenge and win that basketball game. I'd like to see a Golden State Warriors team without Steph Curry and see what they do under such precarious circumstances personally. Hmm. You know, I, I'm going to say this again, Stephen A. I, I find this subject, this topic, this question impossible to logically discuss because the truth is, I don't know how bad his ankle is. I don't think you right. really know how bad it is. I do I, not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that even Steve Kerr could know exactly if the trainers and doctors could know exactly because it, it's hard. O only Steph knows how, what tenderness he's feeling, what instability he's feeling in an ankle with a, obviously a dangerous amount of built up wear and tear in it. Two surgeries on that ankle and as we all talked about before, it was just tissue paper before. There was that one game that I've talked about. He was dribbling the ball up the floor against my Spurs, literally dribbling the ball as the point guard up the floor, and his ankle turned. What? Well, this, this is bad. We thought it might end his career prematurely, and now off. I, I still don't really understand exactly how he rolled his ankle or what, which play it was or what happened exactly because it, it doesn't look that bad when I see the footage of it. But the point is... It's bad enough that he sat out. It's bad enough he got an MRI. And now it's hard for me to know. If you told me it was 98% healed from the little turn that he had the other night, I'd say he should play. Because I'm going to say this again. To me, the Rockets are a weird and dangerous team. They're, they're funky. They're unpredictable. They got some firepower. They're dysfunctional. We know we talked and talked about it. But I don't think they're going to quit in this game. I think they'll come out and play pretty to very hard. And Stephen A., remember, it's still the same, pretty much the same group. What did they do last year? They're down 3-1, to one, not 3-1 to the Clippers. Remember that? And roared back to win that, right? Yeah, but I, I will say this to you, Skip. One thing that I think you're leaving out. Um, and it's nothing. It's up in the air. You got, we got to, everybody's got to decide what they want. Do you want... Steph Curry to get as healthy as he possibly can get before coming back, right? Or do you want him back as soon as possible so you can close out this series as soon as possible? Because I got news for you. We all assume that the Golden State Warriors are going to win this series. The Clippers, in all likelihood, will be waiting. And... Number one, they can't stand the Warriors and vice versa. Okay. So that's a real, real rivalry. And number two, James Harden, you know, scoring is one thing. But Chris Paul is a different beast, especially for somebody like Steph Curry and others. So it's going to be real interesting to see what happens because Golden State's got to make a decision. You literally have to look ahead to some degree to decipher what you should do now. 
as it pertains to Steph Curry. One issue is his health, of course, but the other issue is how ready do you need this guy to be for this next series, assuming they get past Houston and the Clippers get past Portland, because it's going to be heated next go round. That's the one that I, I'm telling you right now, Skip. I've looked forward to that series all year long, just as much as I've looked forward to any series. That is going I to agree. potentially be a big time series with the Clippers and the Warriors. Okay, hypothetical question. If Steph decides to shut it down for the rest of whatever is left of this series, what's the score of this series? Who wins it and what's the score? I think Golden State wins the series in six games. And I say seven games. I think it would take seven in at Golden State to beat this Houston team with no Steph the rest of the way. Mm, I think it would I think they would do so in six. Because I think that they're gonna steal one game in Houston, whether it's game four or game six. All right, seven and six, we shall see. Coming up, Sam Bradford wants out of Philly because they traded up to potentially get a quarterback. What should the Eagles do now? Herm Edwards will join us for that discussion. That's next here on First Take. Couldn't hear the question. That's okay. I said, how will you remember Prince? Um, one of the greatest musicians I've ever seen. Um, I will always love his music. When I think about iconic figures in the music business, um, I, I'm an I'm an R&B guy for the most part, as opposed to pop and and hip hop. Believe it or not, I love my slow jams. I love the Teddy Pendergrasses of the world, the Luther Vandross, Al Green, and you know the list goes on and on. But when it comes to two pop icons, uh, two uh, musicians that transcend uh, gender, transcends geography, transcends so many different things, I think about two people. I thought about Michael Jackson, and I think about Prince, and I think about Raspberry Beret in 1999, Let's Go Crazy. I think about, you know, uh, just Adore and, you know, uh, I mean, Die For You. I mean, just so many, so many of his songs, all of his music, I'm incredibly familiar with, obviously. And I had the pleasure of seeing him perform live on two occasions. On one occasion, it was in 2006 at the Super Bowl where I went there as a fan. I actually had tickets to the game. I wasn't working that game. It was in Miami. Uh, obviously, the Indianapolis Colts were going up against uh, uh, the Chicago Bears, and Tony Dungy before it became the first African-American uh, to win a Super Bowl championship. And it was pouring down raining, and Prince came out there singing Purple Rain. It was it was something special. And then there was another time that, you know, he had, he had a, he had, I, think, I don't know if he rented it or owned it, but it was a house uh, above Beverly Hills. I believe it's in Beverly Park, if I remember correctly. And uh, he had a private party there. And my man, Kevin Frazier, got, uh, you know, for Entertainment Tonight, the inside actually, uh, got me, uh, uh, you know, got, called me and said, meet me here. And I had no idea why, Skip, Molly, I had no idea why. And I take a car, I'm, I, I roll up there, and I said, what you want me to meet you here for? Who's having a party here? He said, Prince, you're invited. Come on in. And he walked up in there, and the who's who of Hollywood and beyond, and Dr. Phil, Sylvester Stallone, you know, and so many others would, showed up to the party, and Prince came out there and performed in his backyard. Uh, it was unbelievable. You know, he was a sensational performer, and of course, you know, uh, for, you know, just to bring a little levity to the situation, um, you can't mention Prince in this day and age uh, without thinking about Charlie Murphy and his true Hollywood stories from the Dave Chappelle show. Yeah. And that skit he did about Prince uh, 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 playing and beating them in basketball. And Prince later revealed it was an actual true story. It wasn't just some comedy skit that Charlie Murphy did. It actually really, really happened. <laughs> he really could ball and really did beat Eddie Murphy and the crew uh, in some basketball, so, or at least Charlie Murphy and them. So it was just, it was absolutely hilarious, one of the most hysterical skits that you'll ever see. Uh, but I, you can't help but think fond memories for Prince because he was truly one of the most sensational uh, music artist that we have and we will ever see and I'm going to miss him greatly but I will always 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 have his wonderful music I will always have that I'm with you when doves cry is in my top five all-time songs and yeah. purple rain is in my top five all-time albums and it came out just before the 1984 Olympics that I covered in L.A., and I wore it out through those two weeks in L.A. 
I was addicted to it. Doves cry. I will die. I would die for you. And everything. Uh, let's go everything. crazy in Purple Rain. Yeah. It's just like yeah. every song mm -hmm. wasn't just good. It was either really good or great. It's just classic, classic, classic. And I saw Prince in 86 in concert. And I got to tell you, I've been to a lot of concerts in my life, especially through the 80s and early 90s. Stephen A., single greatest concert I ever went to was Prince. J just on, on power and impact and showmanship and the ability to sing those songs live as they are recorded. And it, was j it just knocked me out of my seat. And, and again, this may be blasphemous to say, but I saw Michael Jackson twice, and, and I'll give Prince just the slightest edge. He wasn't as physical, he couldn't dance the way Michael could quite, but listen, as a performer, as an artist, he's the definition of artist, singer, songwriter, genius. And, and it really, it got me yesterday because obviously you never anticipate these things coming, but when I first saw the headline, it's like, what, what? Really? And it was really. And I, I still listen to Purple Rain. And I, I now will, I'm going to be listening to it all weekend. No question about yep. it. I mean, uh, listen, listen, the slow jams, the door call me, every, I mean, just everything. I mean, the, the, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, he was just phenomenal on so many levels, but he was also a deep thinker. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I feel for my man Tavis Smiley right now because he's interviewed Prince on several occasions. Yep. Uh, they were pretty close, and obviously Tavis Smiley has done uh, tremendous things uh, in, in terms of his work. Uh, you know, as you know, I, I consider him a journalist with the with the work that he does, particularly the detailed attention that he pays to the African American community, and having Prince talking about a, a bevy of issues, not to mention celebrating his illustrious career. I mean, a lot of folks are hurting to day because we lost a true icon, just mm -hmm. a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. figure and a masterful magician. He was a musician. He mm -hmm. was just something sensational to behold. He really, really was. We're going to miss him. But again, we will always have his music. Yep. He's yep. not going anywhere. His exactly. music is not going anywhere. His music will live on forever. And he gave us so much. We appreciate that. When we come back, we are going to switch gears to the UFC. Conor McGregor isn't retiring after all. His explanation on that after the break.